Welcome to another inspirational message from Chowdean Community Church, Gateshead. For more information about Chowdean, visit www.chowdean.org.uk. We hope you enjoy the podcast. video clip in a minute. Um, So what I thought I'd start with is a story. We're a storytelling movement and because for us we're not an organization who's all flash and all the rest of it. We really believe that God is the God who gave up his own life to reconcile us to him and the stories of reconciliation and transformation is what keeps us going. It's what lets us see that our faith is living and active. So what I wanted to do because it was Father's Day and we were really thinking about this about how even though we work in a, an area where so many fathers are absent or haven't had a good experience, he is such a good, good father. God manifests himself as a father of reconciliation. And so what we're going to watch is a story of um, one of the men and women who I've had the privilege of knowing over the last little bit. quite a struggle growing up in Walker like we still had like a good laugh we had good friends and good family like family lives were good it was just the area like there was never any authority or anyone who could really like relate to or any like youth groups or community centres where we could like go and just be children I grew up, I grew up on the other side of Walker on flooding street um, by uh, not very good parents actually I didn't want to really put my parents to but the you know, they want, they want that, they want good. It was just chaotic in the house and we just ran about doing what we wanted, really. There was no control in the house whatsoever. And we basically got brought up on the streets, like, dragged up on the streets. And by the time, like, what, 11, 12, like, what, into, like, drinking and fighting and drugs. And I ended up in loads so much trouble. By the time I was 15, they actually stuck us on remand. Uh, and from there I went to my first prison sentence which was a short shop shop it was called detention centre at the time at Kirk Levin it was pretty hard but it just you know what it got us prepared for the many crimes I was going to commit when I was little like 14 months um, I got shot in the head um, by this man who came around the house and I, I think he was going to tax me dad or maybe it was something to do with drugs but my dad was selling drugs and um, and that's how it happened. So basically, I got shot from my dad. And look, getting into loads of different things. Uh, one of them was uh, money lending, dealing in cigarettes and beer, and loads of different things. So I had my fingers into that much. Tommy was a money lender, and so I had to go to Tommy to, to, to ask him to, to lend money to us. And uh, I used to have to get, obviously, he, he wanted like one and a half times back or sometimes double back. And I had to do that, you know, but he used to take his benefits book and then like, he would meet us at the first office when I used to get paid. So then take me money on this. He used to make money off, like, obviously doing bad stuff, like drugs and going on backy runs and stuff like that. But, like, we really did have it, like, around child, we had a high life. I wanted to get into the area, to tell you the truth, and uh, that wasn't meant to be, so I ended up on a drink. And from the drink, I ended up on cocaine, which just took us on a roller coaster right to death. For five years, we didn't really see him. I saw him a few times, like, in the gutters and stuff, and I would never say he was my dad. Like, I would ask him for money, but if he didn't give us any, I would just, like, basically kick him when he was down. Like, I would never speak to him. It's totally dead. I woke up in a doss house uh, on Baker. Left for dead, totally skinned, 34 grand dead. And I just... Just didn't know where to go when we like anymore. That just made me take drugs. That made me. It was like a curse. Like he did it, then we did it. My brother was in jail, and my sister had two kids. I was on drugs, and my mum was on drugs, and I didn't have a relationship. I didn't have any authority that I could be like, I need help. But I knew at the end of the day, right? Or something not read, totally not read, and, and I, uh, I was a sinner, totally. And I, I think I was getting that sort of. Perception, but I didn't know how to handle that, and I didn't know how to handle everything that was going on in my life. I felt so much see it there as well. What about God? I was like, God. And, and then I just saw screaming, Help us, man, William, man, look at the steel I'm in, man. Please help us. I need help. 
Help us, Lord. Help us, God. And I said, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. You know, I knew I was sorry. Oh, the stuff I had done, I was, I was repenting. I didn't even know I was repenting. And I fell down on my knees and I was weeping and weeping and weeping for so long. And then all of a sudden I felt this oh, joy. Joy that I've never felt before in my life. There's amazing joy. I knew God was real. I knew that day, totally, that God was real. Right, I'll give me light to Jesus. And he came back and he was like, I was born again Christian. And I was like, what are you going on about? <laughs> like, what are you saying? She used to rebuke the fact that I was uh, that I was a born again Christian. Like, she just couldn't cope with it. I didn't think anybody could. Have. I hated him even more. I just resented him. I was like, how can you leave us? for that many years and come back and, and be OK and have a good life and have that joy inside of you. Like, I really resented it. And then she started to say something. And the spirit, I, I think the spirit in me drew her towards it because she was going through a lot, a lot of bad stuff, you know, and, and it was it was heart-rendering. And I just thought, like, I can't live my life like this. I was losing mass weight. I was being sick, like... Every two minutes, like, making myself a sick and stuff, and I was thinking, like, I can't live this life anymore. Everything in my life was just wrong. Even if a good thing happened, the next day a bad thing would happen, and I was like, right, I need to go to church. Cassie um, actually got saved that night when uh, Pastor Banjo was telling his testimony about what happened to him in Africa, and Cassie just, like, you know, she felt the Lord, and it's just when he asked people to stand up who would like to give the light to the Lord and, and my daughter stood up and I was like, whoa, <laughs> this is amazing, this, like, I've been rabbit not for three years yeah, now, all of a sudden, bang. It's mental how much has changed. It's just more mental as well. I couldn't ask for a better life now. I'm, I'm just a totally new person. I am still loud and I still have that about us, but God's using it in a good way. God's using it to speak to people that have lived the life I've lived. The more, the more she started going on about it, I started listening. And it started to make like certain sense, and I was like really intrigued. I wouldn't be here today without her, I guess. I wouldn't become a Christian myself. I'm going to university and I work in the sage. Like that doesn't happen for people like me. God has really changed my life. Jesus is sure out of the way to like you know sort that problems out and you know to try to understand them and bring them out more rather than the way she because she was angry. She was angry to and all you know, but no shit, not she. Uh, talk about them. For me dad, like, he went from having everything to being nothing, to now having nothing for being everything. How's he changed? He's changed to 180, 180 degrees. I mean, you, could, you know, he's been fantastic. He's on the streets, he's, he's, he's preaching, he's preaching to, the, to the people who need it, you know, the vulnerable, the vulnerable people who need it, you know, the addicts, the homeless, you know, the people in the prison. It's amazing what God has actually done in I can't wait to see what else he does now. I just really can't. You know, since then, the relationship, right, she lives with me, knowing it's just it's just getting better and better and better and better. And this is, and this is what Jesus does. He brings relationships back. It's just totally amazing. Totally amazing. I now have a heavenly father and I have my father. Like, it's so amazing. Jesus had just given us everything I needed. Like, we live together in pray together and we worship together and we just literally we just serve the Lord together in our own community and stuff. It is absolutely amazing. Like I never ever thought I would have a relationship like I have with my dad that I have now. It's so amazing. <laughs> it is, yeah. So it was our pleasure to share that with you this morning because it's what it's all about, isn't it? The transformation of the gospel at work today in our lives and in everyone else's life around us. And the beautiful thing about their story that we see time and time again is that it's not just individual salvation. It's whenever God starts to transform someone's lives, he transforms whole families and whole communities. And you just see the, the physicality of the gospel in the restoration of relationships and the goodness of God come and so for us, we get so excited because it's not just the stories of the ones and twos, but it's a community full of stories like that. And we've come to expect the goodness of God to come and work itself out. And sure, it's messy and it's not simple and all the rest of it, but it's amazing. And it's, it's just, it's just an absolute privilege to see what God's doing in the Northeast in this, this time. 
So like I said, that you know, I direct Junction 42. What is Junction 42? Um, well, the 42 comes from Isaiah 42, which is the next slide. Um, you know, ultimately, we started off as a prison ministry. So we go into prisons, seven prisons in the Northeast, and we just share our faith. We do employability programs. We do outreach programs. So in essence, we do this work day in, day out. But it's because we believe that Jesus has got good news for those who don't even deserve it. Because that's what he came for, not just those who do, but he came for the sick, the broken, the lost, the least, the last. And so we really feel that we go in there, not just to give a light, but to see what God's already doing in there and to, you know, to sort of facilitate that. So that's where the 42 comes from in Junction 42. So we've got a mission statement. All, all organizations have a mission statement, don't they? What we're about, and this is what it is to see the lives of offenders and their communities visibly transformed by the hope of the gospel. And it's that idea that we really believe passionately that it's not like pie in the sky when you die, but it's steak on your plate while you wait. It's sort of cheesy analogy, isn't it? But if God is really who he says that he is, then we will visibly see transformation in this lifetime. We will see visible transformation in our communities and in our relationships. And so for us, it's like, well, put us to the test. Let's see how real this really is. And so one of the things that we're really passionate about is understanding, you know, it's not what we do that's as important as who we are. And so we never really thought about how do we describe what we do and who we are. We, we sort of, we talk about our values and things, but I'd like to hope that what you see in this is what, whenever we looked at Jesus, what he did with his disciples and does with us now. So the first thing we talk about at Junction 42 is journeying with. So I've got quite a lot of pictures because we're all about the relationship but you know I was really thinking about this whenever we set the organization up and it's so easy to do things for and to people but do you ever understand that the Holy Spirit works with us and in us and it's funny because um I was thinking one of my daughters um was about seven or eight before she ever learned to tie her laces and the reason why is because I was always so busy it was easier for me to do it for her than to actually sit with her and teach her how to do it the long, hard way. And one of the things that we realize is, is that we go on a journey with people because it's their journey and God calls us to walk alongside. And the thing is, there's extreme highs in Junction 42 and there's extreme highs in God and there's extreme lows. And the idea is that we don't want to do stuff to people or for people, but we're on a journey with people. And I've, the next one that we talk about is like inspiration and look text. There's a picture of me. <laughs> and do you know what I love? Whenever Jesus was walking with the disciples, they got it wrong constantly. I don't know whether any of you read the stories in the Bible and think, oh my gosh, I so identify with what's going on there. You know, whenever Peter lops someone ear off and Jesus has to go and fix it and, you know, all of that stuff, I just see myself in that story. And one of the things that we've got is that, you know, Junction 42 isn't the thing with the staff and the service users. And it's a lot more gray than that because what we say is, do you know what? You only need to be one step ahead to be an inspiration for someone else. If you've been out of prison two weeks and you meet someone who's just got out that day, you've got a story of inspiration because you're still out two weeks later. So you might as well be doing something right. And so the idea is that we don't have this thing about there's the sorted crew and there's the not so sorted crew. There's the people who are a project and there's people that work the project. And what we're saying is, do you know what? We're brothers and sisters and everyone can be an inspiration. And it's cheesy phrase that I always think about. You know, leadership is not position occupied, but an influence exercised. And everyone here has got a story, and everyone is an inspiration to others. And John will go on to talk about that whenever, G, you know, whenever we know that he is the father of all comfort. And it talks about us, them being that for other people. So, sorry, I'm just flicking through these. <laughs> Relational, what are we? Jesus calls us to be family to each other. What a family do, they experience memories. So we eat together, we mourn together, we have joy together and see the birth of children together. And most of all, you know, whether it's the mountaintop experiences of people going to Norway or whether it's the depths of like walking through broken relationships, it's that idea that we're family together. That's what we are as a church, isn't it? We're family. The next one is that we talk about we're missional together. And do you know what's really interesting? Like I said before, we realize that in Western society, we talk about an individualized salvation. 
that Jesus came for whole families and whole communities, and we're all interlinked. And what I love about this is whether you're rich or you're poor, Jesus came for everyone. And the pictures, the two pictures on the screen, you heard Tommy and Cassie's story, and that's a member of their family who they baptized. And then over on the other side, you've got Chantelle with her family. Now, Chantelle was also involved in um, a bit of a drug take and scene and things like that, but her parents are really affluent and very successful. But her whole family ends up getting saved and healed. Her mom had an extreme allergy to anything that wasn't vegetables and meat, and she ends up getting healed. And then through that, the dad comes, and he ends up becoming a Christian as well. So the whole family gets healed. If you want to hear about that, these stories and how they intermingle with each other, there's, if you go on YouTube and search for Junction 42, there's a non-Christian filmmaker made a film about their stories, and it was shown at the Cannes Film Festival. So if you search Junction 42, Emma Mitchell, you'll see the two stories intermingled. And it's just amazing how there's this family who have everything, extreme, you know, uh, riches, but yet they're still lacking. And then you have this family who grew up in Walker and how the emptiness is the same. So it's beautiful. We understand that it's whole families because we used to just think we work with offenders. That's it. But whenever someone gets out of prison, they're no longer an offender. They're a family member. They've got sons and daughters and they've got brothers and sisters. They've got mums and dads. And we suddenly realize, look, the gospel is for everyone. And it's whole families. Unless you fix the whole family, unless the power of God comes into the whole family, then something's missing. The next two, we can just flick through. These are about, it goes back to that first one. We don't do things for people or to people, but we do it with. But you also have access to opportunities for others. And I think one of the things as Christians that we do is we've got the ability to open doors for other people if they choose to walk through them. So the next two slides just sort of show some of the things that we've been doing together. We've done like some theological training. We do some job clubs. We, we, we present opportunities to people that they might never have had. So many men and women don't even have a passport. They've never been out of their community. So what is it if you've never been to university to start thinking about going to university? Cassie has just finished a degree in leadership and management, sorry, business and management. She's done so well, but she never thought like she says, a girl from Walker would even think about that sort of stuff. She's traveled halfway around the world. She's got a passport. You know, the idea that people start to believe that they've got the opportunities that other people have. And that's what being part of family is all about. So, like, I feel a bit like I've done the Junction 42 presentation and explained who we are. <laughs> and I apologize for that. But what I'm trying to say is, look, this is what it is to be family in very pragmatic ways. We look at Jesus and who he was. And John's going to come and share a little bit, but I just wanted to share a story. That's, sorry, it's on the phone. There's a story that's typical of the community that we're part of. So it's someone else's story that I'm just going to read out. I grew up in a criminal family where prison and violence, especially domestic violence, was the norm. With my dad in and out of prison, my mom was at home struggling to cope with us four wild and uncontrollable children who she periodically placed in care. I loved my mom and dad very much, and back then I couldn't understand my mom's need to be loved and why she would sleep with different men while my dad was in prison. I was desperate for my mum to stop and threatened to write to my dad if she didn't. She didn't, so I picked up the pen. When I turned 11, my dad got released from prison, and after a drink-fueled reunion, mum and dad returned home arguing. This escalated into violence. My two brothers, sister, and I screamed as we watched our mum being beaten. The babysitter tried to restrain us in our desperate bid to rescue our mum, but she is dragged upstairs by her hair frozen with fear. I break free from the babysitter and run up the stairs begging dad to stop. The night ends with me peering through a crack of barricaded doorway to see the carpet seeping with the blood from my mum's lifeless body which has been stabbed multiple times. The scene is quite eerily quiet, a 
as my dad lies motionless after an attempt to take his own life. At that moment, my world changed. I lost my mum to death and my dad to prison. After this, I was put in the care of my grandparents, but they blamed and despised me. After all, as the judge said, it was my letters that made my dad do it. This led to the neglect, violence and abuse from my uncles and grandparents. You see, these were the people who were supposed to love him. And perhaps you won't be surprised to hear the outcome of this guy's story. Truancy from school, running away, petty crime, drug taking. And from the ages of 17 to 24, he was a full-blown alcoholic heroin addict and a regular guest at Her Majesty's pleasure, sampling many of the establishments in this country. You see, in what we do, what do we see? Do we see that he is a victim of circumstance, upbringing and experience? Who is to be pitied and his current behavior excused? Do we feel sympathetic? Or do we see him as a criminal drug addict who you have every reason to be cautious of? Do we feel fearful? Or do we see an individual who is too far gone, too much has happened and the need is so great and complex it's impossible to entangle and we feel overwhelmed? Well, the thing is, just perhaps God has got a different narrative. Perhaps he wants us to see a future leader who's got potential to overcome the addiction, whose pain, adversity, and struggle has developed character, empathy, and grit. Someone who has the ability to give, hope, and believe so much more than any of us ever could. You see, whenever we believe that, we feel hope. And so that's where the scripture comes into play. And it's the last scripture that we'll put on and John's going to come and chat to us because he is the father of all comfort who comforts us in our trials so we can reach out and comfort others with the same comfort we ourselves have received. Wow, you can hear a pin drop when you hear that story. Every time I hear that story, it brings tears to my eyes. But the, the, the weird part about that story is I'm that person. That's my story. And Jesus is so amazing, isn't he? Jesus can transform anyone. And he can come into the darkest of situations. And, and one of the big things that I believe is that the gospel is the power of God. Onto salvation to everyone who believes so the gospel has transformational power in it to transform the darker souls. And I'm a local lad. I'm, I'm from the felon. Yay. I actually said this. Um, I went to a CVM conference. I said, I'm from felon. This old guy pipes up. No, you're not. You're from the felon. <laughs> and I forgot. Yeah, I'm from the felon, actually. Um, I, I grew up. I was born and bred in the felon. Um, I'm, I'm from Gated through and through. I, I grew up in Leem Lane after my mom died. After that story, I went to live with my grandparents. Um, I went to Hewith Grange. Um, and I, I was just a local lad and I grew up on the estate. I, I grew up around criminals um, in Balmoral Drive. It's dead posh now. Um, but when I was growing up, it wasn't posh. In my role models, my father figures were criminals because I had both parents taken away, so all I knew was crime, and that, that was the life I was going to go down, because they were older guys, and I looked up to them, and they taught us how to do crime. And like John says, I, I've been in seven prisons, some of them in and out, in and out, in and out. Serious heroin addict, I used to inject heroin into my veins. But in 1999, I never forget this, I cried out to Jesus and says, if you're real, come into my life. And the power of the Holy Spirit came upon us, and I never touched heroin again. How amazing is that? And one of the things, you know, like listening to Tommy and Cassie, like the, the transformation, that, that was a long time ago, that video, the change that's happened in them is, is just unbelievable. Cassie's just for getting a degree. Um, like Joanne says, she now wants to do a master's. It, it, this is the plan God has for people's lives. Do you know, he wants us to go from one degree of glory to another. He wants people to look at us and say, how can you say you lived that life? Where, look at where you are now. And this is what Jesus does. 
This is the hope of the gospel, isn't it? We believe in God's purpose for people. And when I was first saved, I had this vivid dream. It's actually in that story, but Joanne didn't share it. I had this vivid dream, and I was in front of a prison. Um, by the way, Tommy as well, the, the guy who we just mentioned there, he's cleared. Now he goes in prisons, so he's cleared to go in prisons. And as I'm in this dream, I saw this kind of scenario going on. And in front of the prison, it, was, it wasn't much different to this back of the room here, and the, the, the prison windows were there. And then at night, what happens in prison is activity happens, and they make lines, they're called fishing lines, they get heavy weights, and they pull the wool blankets apart, and they tie the wool blanket, and they put heavy weights, and they throw them out the window. And some of these can go for miles, and they, they fish in contraband, drugs, magazines, pornography. It, this scene happens every night, and it, it, at night, prison comes alive, because that's where they can pass stuff. And there's only a couple of officers circle the prison, and they can't see everything. And as soon as they see the officers, what, they warn each other, and they pull in this line. And as I'm standing seeing this situation, I heard God behind me saying, John, what do you see? And I'm thinking, is God blind? It's like, it's criminal activity. And, and I, I, I just said these words. I says, God, criminals, thieves and rogues. That's what I could see. And he said, John, look again. What do you see? And as I looked, I heard God behind me say, John, I see kings. Prophesy to the kings. And I woke up and I was like, wow. And I started thinking about that. And what I realized is God doesn't see criminals, rogues, and thieves. He sees people who've got authority. Do you know, Jesus says, all authority has been given to me by my father. I give it to you. And kings have authority. They have the power of God in their lives. And what God was saying is, John, I'm raising up men and women with the power of God in their lives. Kingly people who know who their God is. You know, the Bible says those who know their God shall do great exploits. And this is what God sees. He doesn't just see victim criminals. He doesn't see victim situations. He sees purpose in the pain. And this is at Junction 42, we believe that there's purpose out of the pain. And God can transform the darkest lives. And on the back of that whole, um, you know, I'm cleared now to go in prisons. I've got a set of keys for prison. The very prison that I was in over and over and over again, I open the prison doors now. Only God can do that. You know, how can God give us keys that I shouldn't even have them? I've still got a criminal record. If you do a DBS check on my, my past, I've got a massive criminal record. But God opens doors, doesn't he? You know, we've adopted our, our little girl, Leone. We've adopted her. I should never have been able to adopt with a criminal record. But God is the God who opens miracle doors and does the impossible. And, and one of the situations of the prison, based on that dream, I don't know if anyone's seen the film Kingsman. Has anyone seen the film Kingsman? Probably the younger guys. Um, and this is a, a criminal who's come off the streets. And this English gent stands him in front of a mirror. And he says... What do you see? I see a man with potential. And he trains him up how to be this special force elite fighter, you know, in the, in the English special forces. And, and this is what we did. We created a course called Kingsman. It's an entrepreneurial training course that we train prisoners how to change their life and how to start thinking entrepreneurially. And, and I set up a business. I couldn't get a job. I had a business. And I, I ran the business for 10 years. I've got another company now that I've set up. And I work with Junction 42. And it's, it's a sign of hope that God can change people. I didn't know anything about business. I was just a, a criminal entrepreneur. I, I knew how to make money the wrong way. But God says, no, John, you know how to make money. Do it the right way. You know, do things the right way. Set up businesses and, and, and speak hope into people's lives. So that's the kind of bit of a foundation, but one of the things I want to chat about, obviously it's Father's Day, is I was fatherless. I didn't have any role model in my life. My granddad was a heavy drinker. You know, I heard, I heard the lady there say about living with her nana. You know, I, I lived with my nana, um, but my nana wasn't a very nice person. And, and you know, she, when she looked at me, she saw me dad and saw all the hatred and anger that she had because my mom was her only daughter. 
she pushed that upon me and, and it used to beat me. They broke my, one of my uncles broke my nose when I was 12 years old. You know, I was fatherless and I didn't have a father. And so the wrong people came into your life, like I explained earlier. But when I became a Christian, I, I, I started, you know, some people say they know Jesus more, they know the Holy Spirit more, they know the Father more. With me, it was the Father. God showed us the unconditional love of a Father, and it transformed my life. Or he just put Paul's unconditional love in every day, and it transformed my life. And I used to cry a lot, you know, when I was first saved. I lived in Vega. And um, every day I would just break down because it was God's father heart love coming into my life and changing my life. And, you know, there's a Bible verse that says um, in, in 1 Corinthians 4, it says, I do not write these things to make you ashamed, but to admonish you as my beloved children. For though you have countless guides in Christ, you do not have many fathers. For I become your father and Jesus Christ through the gospel. And one of the things God did with me is he put father figures in my life. You know, I went to um, City Church in Newcastle. And I, I used to go every week and I'd be like, God, I, get me out of this church. I was the only ex-offender in the church. And they were all dead nice. Everyone was nice. And I was just not very nice at the time. And I was dead honest. And I would just, you know, if something was crap, I would say it was crap. You know, and people be like, ooh, Flo, he's saying, like, real words here. <laughs> it's like, and, uh, you know, when I first went in, there was handbags lying around, and I had to kind of slap my head and say, stop looking at people's possessions, John. You've changed. The old man's dead. The new has come. And, but God spoke to us and says, John, there's fathers here. I want you, you know, I had a dream, a vivid dream. God speaks to me through dreams. And I would be slagging off the leaders every week to God. And as in this dream, they were sitting around this round table and they all had silver hair. And I woke up and I knew instantly God would say, listen to them, John, because they have wisdom. And God said, stay in that church. I stayed in that church for 10 years. That's how I met Joanne. Joanne came to City Church. And God transformed us by people who become fathers in my life. One guy who's um, counseled us quite a lot, and he, he did our marriage prep, and they've, they've, um, we've also had marriage counseling after that. <laughs> people, say, people say, marriage counseling, you're like, you're an organization. Yeah, because we, we understand that we need fathers in our lives, and we need God's counsel. And uh, we didn't get divorced, so it kept us going. We've been married how long now, John? 14 years. Um, by God's grace. But God needs... Fathers, there's many mothers and fathers in this room, and God wants fathers and mothers to train up the younger generation, to train up the people in Gates, to disciple them. You know, like Joanne says, a lot of the guys where I'm from, from the council estates, most of them didn't have mothers and fathers in their lives, so they went off the rails. And one of the things, you know, just recently, well, our girls, God starts, te he's teaching me how to be a father to my girls. And, and how to train them. You know, the Bible says train a child in the way it should go when it's young. And it won't depart when they're older. And, and one of the things about God is, what I've learned is, he's, he's a God of discipline. You know, it says God disciplines. I want to read this out. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? If you are left without discipline in which you have participated, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. Besides this, we have had earthly fathers who disciplined us and we respected them. Shall we not much more be subject to the Father of spirits and live? For they disciplined us for a short time as it seemed best to them, but he disciplines us for our good that we may share in his holiness. For the moment all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant, but later it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. I looked up the word discipline. It means to train and to be self-controlled. And just yesterday, I was in the house and I felt the Holy Spirit say, John, you, you have to discipline your girls and you have to be consistent with it because discipline's not nice. They'll not like you for it. You're, not, you're, you're their dad. You're not meant to be liked. You've got to train your children the way to go. And, but, they'll, but they'll respect you for it as time goes on. And, and, you know, 
And 10 o'clock last night, I got gets a text. I don't know. I was in the in the bedroom, me and John were chatting, and I just I, I went downstairs. And as I went downstairs, Kezia's phone got a text at quarter past 10. She's nine years old. So I goes, whoa, what's going on here? So I, cut, I didn't even know the pin for the phone. I'm telling you, these days, you've got to be careful with your kids' phones. You've got to, you've got to watch them like a hawk. So I basically goes up to John, she opens the, the text, and um, it's on her phone. But this guy's texting Kezia, saying, um, your friend, Neela, I've, um, I don't have feelings for her, blah, blah, blah. And I'm listening to this text. I'm thinking, she's nine years old. So I went, right, where's the dad live? That, that was the old self coming up there. <laughs> and uh, so I text the boy. I says, look, it's unacceptable. You, John's like, no, 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 he's like nine years old. I went, I'm texting his boy to tell him not to text me daughter. So I says, look, it's unacceptable. It's 10, 15 at night. You're texting my daughter. I'm going to chat to your dad. I get to text straight back saying, I'm really sorry, sir. <laughs> <laughs> And I, I'm like, oh, I felt compassion for the young guy. He's probably panicking. He's lying in bed. He's, not, he's like, crap, what have I done? And um, so I said, right, I'll let you off this time. Don't do it again. But then this morning over breakfast, the girls had made this lovely breakfast. I get up and, and, you know, we chatted to Kezia and we're saying, Kezia, you, you, you've got to be wise with your phone. And, and we, we really imparted wisdom to her. And we said, look, what we're going to do is you can't have your phone anymore for bed. Because she uses her phone for her alarm clock. We'll get your alarm clock. We'll take your phone out. Because we know Kezia wants to do the right thing. But she's getting influenced by all these outside situations. And, and when I grew up, I didn't have a father figure to impart that wisdom to me. You know, I, I was just lived an unruly life. And I became, because I didn't have those boundaries, I lived an unruly life. But I've had a father who sat me down and said, John, look, don't go this route. You know, achieving your life. I had dreams when I was 11. I remember I had dreams for my life. And if I had had a father who was there for us, training us to go my dreams, I would have lived a much better lifestyle. And so to challenge the people and the fathers in here, you know, find people who you can disciple. Find young people because they're, they're out there. Like we run a Connect Newcastle. I lead one of the communities of Connect Newcastle. And some guys, sometimes we have 80, 90 guys coming, the ex-prisoners, ex-offenders, people from the council estates, working class people. And, and do you know what? They just need direction in their life. They need people to believe in them and speak life into them. And that's what Jesus did, didn't he? He grabbed 12 disciples who are, like John says, who are a funny old bunch. You know, call, want to call down fire from heaven sometimes. It's like kill people. Do you know and, and they were messed up guys, but Jesus believed in them and spoke. And you know what Jesus said? You know, they, they, they said, show us the Father. He says, I've been with you the whole time. I am the Father. Jesus is the Father is in me, and I am in the Father. And Jesus revealed the Father heart to these men. And then look what happened. They transformed the world. And this is what we believe at Junction 42. These men and women we're reaching are the next leaders. Why not be the next politicians? Why not be the next people in, in purpose, in the, in the counselors and businesses? Why not? That's how God sees. He sees men and women of potential. So if anyone wants to get involved with Junction 42, we, 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 we do a lot of different things. Um, one of the big things we do is employment, and we're, we're always looking for volunteers, people who've got time on their hands and they want to actually practically help. Some of our guys go in prison. I think when people hear prison ministry, they go, oh, it's a bit rough going in prisons. But you know what I've found in prisons? The, the guys are the most respectful guys you'll ever meet. They, they never put it in. They stop swearing when they come into the chapel. These are guys who are probably taking drugs and violence, and then as soon as they walk in the chapel, they stop swearing. And, they, you know, it's amazing what, do, what God does. Um, just like... Uh, Sorry to have to say this text, but like Tex, I met Tex in prison. He served a massive prison sentence. God's totally transformed that. How long have you been out now, Tex? Three and a half years. And God is blessing his life. He's, he's in all these music bands. He's played in the Clooney. He was in uh, Lisa's Park yesterday. God's raising him up. You've even been in the House of Lords, haven't you, Tex? House of Lords. 
How amazing is God, isn't he? Amazing. So if you want to be involved and get, get excited about God and seeing transformed lives, come and help with Junction 42. We've got some banners there and we've got some um, cards. If anyone wants to leave their details, we'll, we'll get in touch. Um, one of the staff members of Junction 42 will get in touch. So thanks, thanks for listening to us today. This is the end of this message. We hope you enjoyed it. If you want to find out more about our church, please visit www.chowdean.org.uk and please take a minute to rate our podcast on iTunes.